Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki, working as Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I am taking up the course titled as White Collar Crimes and in today's session we will be talking about the emergence of white collar crimes in India. The objectives of today's session would be as follows. To trace the evolution of social and economic offences in the Indian context, to discuss the response of the state for combating the white collar crimes in India, to discuss organized crime, occupational crime and corporate crime, to understand the corporate criminal liability, the observations made by the Supreme Court in Tufan Singh versus State of Tamil Nadu 2021 Supreme Court. Now when we look at the heading of this slide, it says social and economic offences, whereas I had referred to the title of today's session as emergence of white collar crimes in India. So one must ask that whether are we talking about two different things or these terms are being used interchangeably. Now, when we look at the social and economic offences, the two words are being used in here which can be understood as those offences which have social implications, which all offences do, generally speaking. But when we talk about the impact of these offences, the entire society or small groups or the community at large are getting impacted. The example in this point could be of adulteration, that invariably we are talking about one victim, but if we look at the impact of let's say adulteration or food poisoning, it is impacting a larger group belonging to the society. Now, we have another word in here that is economic offences. Now, Sutherland had noted that when we talk about white collar crimes, these are financial crimes which are non-violent crimes and they are motivated with making of large profit. Now, Obviously, we do see some crimes happening which were existing even in the traditional crime census wherein let's say a pensioner has not paid the taxes. Now this pensioner is not doing this offence in the course of his occupation, right? So it has nothing to do with his occupation. But nonetheless, when he does not pay the taxes, is he causing the loss to the exchequer? He may do so by doing the tax fraud or by not paying taxes, by reducing his liability illegally. Now, when we talk about the impact of this, this may be called as the economic crime, but this is not the white collar crime because the correlation between the two essential ingredients that are that the person must be of some social class or high status, that he must have done that act during the course of his business, occupation or profession. And in our example, the pensioner was not holding his office. This was something that he did in his personal capacity, not anything to do with his office. So what is the kind of crime that we can label it as? This is an economic crime. So when we look at social and economic offenses in India, when the society was marking the shift from rural society to urban society as the society was getting more and more complex because of industrialization and the competitiveness and monopoly in the market started to set its feet in the Indian market. We also saw that new form of criminality started to emerge in the Indian context. So it is very important for us to remember this point that white collar crime Three ingredients are important in there. One, it is committed by a person. Now, what is committed? A non-violent crime is committed. Second, that this person belongs to of social status and high respectability. Third, the correlation between the offense and the occupation that he is holding. 
whereas in socio and economic offences, these can be offences like adulteration, tax evasion by an individual, so on and so forth. Why? Because they have ramifications which can be looked into from the point of social, material loss, loss of wealth of people or community. Now, when we are trying to trace that at what point of time India started to actually notice that this new form of criminality is emerging in India, at that point of time, we were not aware whether we could call these offences as white collar crimes. You must remember that it was Edwin H. Sutherland who in the 1939 year coined this term as white collar crime. And in here on the slide, we are tracing its origin and we are going back in time at the time when we were witnessing the first world war. So at that point of time, rapid industrialization happened, which led to the creation of two social classes. One was the industrialist, industrial capitalist and the other was the modern working class. That witnessed the influx to the urban areas from the rural areas and the industry activity further multiplied. Now this had resulted in increased disassociation of the workers from their rural lives which accentuated the restricting of the Indian society. Now that was the time when we were seeing the substantial transition how the nature or the structure of the society started to change slowly and slowly as it became more and more complex. As I said, extreme business competitiveness and search for monopolistic advantages ensued along with natural and implicit associated criminalistic behavior. So when you thrive on the motive that you want to make more and more money, you will be reckless to the means that you are adopting you are only concerned with the outcome that is the profit making. Now, once you start making those profit by adopting illegal or unlawful means, you may continue to do, you may continue to do again and again with causing great and great loss to the exchequer of the society. Now, when we see this was the time when we saw that new form of criminality has emerged and this new form of criminality can be labeled as a class of socio-economic offenses. So this was the time when India witnessed really the emergence of socio-economic offenses. Now fast forward to the Second World War. When the West was busy in dealing with the Second World War, countries like England, United States, Japan, Germany and France, they were busy with the production and handling the arm and ammunition, let alone supplying the food supplies to India. So now India had to sustain it itself and that's when the market started to emerge more and more, where the scrupulous businessmen and the manufacturers took the advantage of the political scenario that was existing at that point of time. So the entire country and its resources were engaged in the production and supply war, geared in furtherance of the war effort. It was in this context that some measure to control and regulate essential supplies were needed to be enacted in the form of Defense of India Act 1939. So at that point of time, when we see that there is scarcity of essential goods in the market, where the people were engaged in hoarding of those goods so that they these commodities can be sold at the inflated profits. It is then the state realized that these essential commodities must be controlled by them. And that resulted into having the Essential Commodities Act, wherein the state would control the prices of these essential commodities. Further, we also saw another legislation like the Drugs Act 1940, Drugs and Cosmetics Act 1940, the Central Excise Act 1944, the Prevention of Corruption Act 1947. Now, in one of the following lectures, we will talk about that how, when this legislation was being made, the Prevention of Corruption Act, one committee was constituted, that is the Bakshi Tekchand Committee, which was entrusted with the responsibility of 
seeing how this legislation is actually performing and the corruption was said to be existing especially in the war department or import and export department of the government all these public servants were taking were enriching their pockets and it is at that point this committee was constituted that how we can improvise the law and how can we improvise the enforcement machinery then we also see foreign exchange regulation act 1947 now after this uh, there was sudden increase in the socio economic offenses the reason another reason is after the partition when the state was busy in rehabilitating the population these people who were already adopting the practices where they were selling the food items or essential commodities at inflated prices they were served with one good opportunity if you look at the scenario at that point of time now in one of my previous sessions i said that winston churchill had once said that never let a good crisis go to waste so people find these opportunities of making profits in adversity right i also refer to bakshi tekchan committee which was constituted in 1949 there was some recommendations which were made by the bakshi tekchan committee and we must look at the same in this committee the observation was as that mens rea in the context of socio economic offenses we must make a departure from it now what does it mean the criminal jurisprudence uh, follows the principle that the prosecution needs to prove the guilty mind of the accused so it is not only the act that can be criminalized this act has to be coupled with the guilty mind of the individual now let's talk about adulteration let's talk about uh, selling the essential commodities at inflated profits these types of activities take place in secrecy or we can say that they are clandestine in their nature they are being committed within the four walls and nobody would get to know if the harm or injury has been caused to the victim now because it is very difficult to actually trace or detect these crimes the committee suggested that the essential element which is mens rea that the prosecution must prove the guilty mind of the accused must be done away with so we are not completely saying that it is not required we will see in some of the special legislations that prosecution needs to prove one or two ingredients and then legal friction is created wherein it will be presumed that the person alleged is the guilty and he then needs to disapprove this legal presumption and this presumption is not conclusive it is a rebuttable presumption so we are not completely doing away with the element of mens rea we are just making the departure from this essential ingredient of the mens rea then the second suggestion was that minimum punishment for deterrent effect now if we look at some offenses let's say at that point of time when someone was a public servant and he was taking illegal gratification one must resort to section 161 of the then law that is the indian penal code we are talking about the year 1949 so this public servant will be prosecuted under section 161 hypothetically speaking let's say if we look at the punishment the punishment is termed as may be punishable with an imprisonment which may extend to 1 year now only the maximum punishment is prescribed here in the form of imprisonment or with fine so in here the judge has a discretion that he can either impose the imprisonment which may extend up to 1 year minimum punishment is not prescribed or with fine the experience of the judiciary was uh, that lot of people were getting away with these offenses which must be considered as serious offenses only with the fine why because there was no requirement under the law that this person has to be mandatorily 
punished for the minimum punishment so to cause more deterrent effect or for people to take this offenses more seriously it was suggested that the minimum punishment shall also be prescribed in here now when we talk about the enforcement part of it traditionally the intent or the objective of the legislature is to criminalize a conduct or the result of the conduct but when we talk about that whether criminal law can act as a model to regulate the behavior of the individual the answer to that is yes so the committee noticed that the criminal laws in place must also aspire to not only penalize but also to prevent and regulate the behavior of individual when we are talking about the presumption as discussed in point number 1 whenever we are doing away with the mens rea the degree is been reduced you will always find a deemed clause within the special legislations which creates the legal fiction now in here the burden of proof will be shifted upon the accused this person will presume to be guilty and then he needs to prove that he was innocent now the committee has categorized the socio economic offenses under the following categories and these categories are rather important we are referring to santhanam committee report of 1962 K Santha Rao was the member of parliament and within the uh, advice of the then prime minister this committee was constituted only to look into the functioning of the anti graft law when i say anti graft law i am talking about the corruption that was existing in the public offices the committee had undertaken the study in the year 1962 and had made some recommendations which we will see the scope of the work was limited to the prevention and detection of misappropriation and maladministration in government de departments so we were referring to the corruption in the public departments or we can say in the public offices the objective were to fold it one to review the problem of corruption and make suggestions on various matters connected therewith second suggest changes in the law so that the case of bribery corruption and criminal misconduct can be tried and disposed of in expeditious manner now when the committee had undertaken the study they had suggested the establishment of one statutory body which will look into the investigation part of these corruption that was prevailing at that point of time so as a result what we see today that central bureau of investigation is actually the outcome of this santhanam committee report so this committee had led to the establishment of independent anti corruption agency to investigate corruption cases this led to the establishment of cbi in 1963 and cvc in the year 1964 so when we talk about what is cvc it is the vigilance department which makes sure that the agencies that are working against the prevention of corruption act are working well when we talk about that sanction needs to be taken for the prosecution of the public servant cvc will make the vigilance of this aspect that how many sanctions have been applied for and in how many cases the sanctions have been already given it also collects it also collates the data pertaining to the enforcement of the act whether they can investigate the matter the answer is no but they can refer the matter to be inquired and investigated into but nonetheless they can still make the preliminary inquiry now the committee had categorized the socio economic offenses under the following categories and this is important for us because that was the first point when the state had taken the cognizance that we must look into that what is the new form of criminality which may exist in various forms under the indian context and these are the first of the few 
offenses which were recognized by the santhanam committee one offenses calculated to prevent or obstruct the economic development of the country so when we talk about let's say the parallel economy is on rise we are talking about the black money that hampers the economic development of the state the taxes which should be going to the exchequer of the state those are not been paid rather a parallel economy is on the rise where the money is been circulated through the hawala channels so what is happening the loss has been caused to the uh, exchequer of the state and that will automatically result into the inflation of the prices and it will also impact the welfare policies of the government so essentially it is impacting the material health and wealth of the society so in that sense it was noticed that those offenses which prevent or obstruct the economic development of the state second is the evasion or avoidance of the taxes lawfully imposed now what we look in here is the tax evasion and the tax avoidance uh, in the later part of today's discussion we will be talking about that what is the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance misuse of the public offices that are being held by the public servants now public servants are known to enter into the contract for an instance if we talk about constructions of the highways or supplying of the food items to the government they do enter into the contract with the private parties now in order to secure the contract this third party may offer the bribe to the public servants so in that sense the public servant are actually abusing their offices and they are misusing their offices for unjustly enriching themselves fourth is profiteering black marketing and hoarding so whenever we see that any crisis has emerged in the uh, given point of time all these business owners or manufacturers starts to hoard the food items because there is huge demand and the supply is restricted so essentially they will be selling these food items or any commodity for that matter at very exorbitant rate that is how they are hoarding the goods and then making the profit out of it fifth is adulteration now this aspect is important when we refer to adulteration it could mean adulteration in food it could also mean adulteration in drugs so do we have relevant provisions with regard to that we will be discussing that in one of our sessions sixth is theft and misappropriation of public property and funds so when we talk about let's say some property has been entrusted to the public servant which he is only allowed to use for the official purposes but he then starts misappropriating them what is happening in here there is a misappropriation or there may be a theft which is committed by this public servant and it is an example of white collar crime as well because this public servant is doing something during the course of his occupation why is he doing so because he wants to make profit or he wants to unjustly enrich himself seventh is trafficking in license and permits now what does this mean if we look at the rules and regulations you are not allowed to be given the license or the permit let's say the sale of liquor but because you had certain contacts with the public officers you were able to secure this license or permit but this comes at a price that obviously you have given the gratification to the public servant so when we talk about this the licenses may be taken in my name but the business is controlled by the other person and the licenses are been then switched as well so this refers to the trafficking in license and permits now delivery of goods not in accordance with the contracts in one of the previous examples i had said that government do enter into the contract with the private party and the contract is prescribing the goods of certain quantity or quality but both the things or aspects have been compromised why because the public servant is not bothered about what quality or quantity of goods have been supplied why because he is just interested in enriching himself so all these acts or conducts or the results of these acts and conducts can be categorized under the head of socio economic offenses 
Now, why we are using the wider bracket of socio-economic offences? One could say that socio-economic offence is a bigger circle, right? And white-collar crime is a subset of it. Socio-economic offence is wider in the sense that it has nothing to do with the occupation of the offender. Whereas, if we strictly follow the definition of Sutherland, it has to have something to do with the office or business or profession or occupation of the individual. So, if we look at this list, some examples are that when we talk about this aspect that is adulteration, when we talk about evasion of taxes, evasion of taxes can be done by any individual XYZ. Adulteration is being done by the manufacturer. Now, one is the example of, both are the examples of socio-economic offences, but only the one is the example of white-collar crime. And that is the adulteration because this person is doing a particular act which is an offence during the course of his business. So, we are not limiting this only to the office that the person is holding, but this office has to be interpreted in the wider context, which can also include your business, your profession, your trade and so on and so forth. Now, what happened after this uh, study was undertaken by the Santanam committee? The committee had made certain suggestions and that was that to have new chapters to be added in the IPC, bringing together all the offences in the special enactment and supplementing them with new provisions so that all the offences are curated in one general law. However, we will see that this suggestion was not being followed by the 29th Law Commission subsequently. The committee suggested the work of addition of new chapters to the I IPC, which is to be referred to the Special Committee or the Law Commission. So, Santanam Committee had led to three new developments. One is the 29th Law Commission, second is the establishment of CVC and before that is the creation of the Central Investigating Agency that is the CBI. Now, coming to the 29th Law Commission Report 1966, the Title of this report was Proposal to Include Certain Social and Economic Offences in the Indian Penal Code. Now, what necessitated to have this uh, commission and to make the changes in the law? At that point of time, the IPC was being drafted 100 years ago. So, we are in the year 1966. So, from this point, IPC was drafted 100, 100 years ago, which was relevant to the situations existing at that point of time. Now, we did see that the society, the structure of the society had changed immensely, necessitating that we must address the new form of criminality. And it was realized that the IPC code does not in any manner satisfactorily deal with this new emerging criminality in the Indian context. Now, which was the dominant feature of the certain social class of the modern society? So, when we talk about that, when we refer to socio-economic offences or white-collar crimes, in one of the commissions, it was noticed that white-collar crime is the characteristic of the acquisitive and the affluent society. Now, these are the crimes which are not committed by the lower strata of the society. Rather, these are the crimes which were perpetrated by the middle class or the higher class. So, when we look at the loss that has been caused by these offences, the cost of these crimes are much more higher than the traditional offences. Now, let's understand with the example. When we talk about theft or extortion, let's say 5,000 rupees has been stolen, but when we say the corporate has evaded the taxes to the tune of 1,000 crores. So, we may equate one crime on one hand, which is the white collar crime, and maybe thousands and thousands of traditional crimes, still the white collar crime will weigh over the 
traditional crimes in terms of the cost and that necessitated that we must make the necessary changes. Now the proposal of the committee was as I had stated to have the offences classified under the provisions of the IPC where the victim is a small group or the community of the society. Now when we talk about that committee were making, the committee was making essential observation, the committee also noticed that when we analyze socio-economic offences, certain characteristics come to the surface that this is the offence committed by the upper classes of the society. Now these upper classes set the moral standards and hence a serious view is not taken of these offences. Now what does this mean? Now when we say that it is the public servant who was corrupt, they are accumulating the wealth. Now these are the people who were generating and augmenting all the wealth and to be invested in the entertainment area. Now these people are enjoying the reputation in the society when they move around. People look up to them. So when a murder is being con committed, we condemn that murder. But when a white collar crime, let's say, has evaded the taxes, many other people start looking up to them and think that we may also do the same thing because it is worth the risk and we want to be like him because then he is enjoying certain social status into the society. So even if we talk about that the consequences of these offences are pervasive, people do not see that some harm has actually resulted into after the commission of these offences as they do in the cases of traditional offences where a physical injury has been caused. So when we talk about vengeance, same sentiment is not aroused when we refer to the white collar crimes and even if they do some crimes, people still look up to them. Now the third point is the victim of these offences are uncertainable persons or state or community. In contrast to majority offences under IPC, where the victim is individual or a small group. Earlier, I had used the example of adulteration. In adulteration, certain section of the society is getting impacted. Now, there are some important observations which was made by this 29th Law Commission and I have referred to the relevant paragraphs. Para number 2.14 says, that corruption can exist only when there is someone willing to corrupt. And the commission noticed that the willingness and capacity to corrupt is found in large measure in the industrial and the commercial classes operating in India. Now, this commission has referred to this paragraph extracted from the Santhanam report. So, if we go back to the previous slide, Law Commission report is from the year 1966 and when we look at the Santhanam Committee report, it is in the year 1962. So, the Commission had referred to the Santhanam Committee report 1962. Now, as I said, it is these people who indulge in evasion of taxes. Who are these people? people who are coming from professions which are respectable professions. It is they who have the control over the funds and it is them who decide the standards of the behavior of the common people in the society. So it is very, very challenging at that point of time that how does state combat this type of criminality which has been perpetrated by the influential class in the society. Now in the previous session I had said that when we refer to white collar crime, the victim is weak and their ally is strong. When we talk about ally, people who are in the enforcement, people who are deciding their cases. Now referring to para 9 of the 29th report, it was noted by Sutherland that one of the reasons for the differential implementation of the law in the areas of white collar crime was relatively unorganized resentment of the public towards such crime. The reason for the absence of such resentment was stated to be as follows. A. 
The violation of law in such cases are complex and can only be appreciated by experts. B. The public agencies of communication like press do not express the organized moral sentiment of the community partly because the crimes are complicated and cannot be easily presented at news but probably in greater degree because these agencies of communications are themselves controlled by the businessmen involved in the violations of the of many of these laws now what sutherland was trying to say here that when we look at how society responds to the white collar crime the collective response is missing we we may feel bad for one or two days but then we forget about it why because when we talk about the typology of white collar crimes they are essentially or generally broadly financial crimes so we do not see that the injury that has been caused because it is the loss is quantifiable in money but if we were talking about a life has been lost or someone has been hurt we are able to relate to that person with empathy so sutherland was saying that the response of the society the resentment towards these offenses is unorganized for two reasons one that the nature of these offenses are very very complex it takes the technical expertise for the detection of these crimes let's say the crime has committed today and it had been revealed let's say after 10 years of the commission of this offense so it took 10 years for the detection and we may forget about it what happened 10 year ago so in this case because it required technical expertise for the detection because if we talk about tax evasion it may involve layers of documents running into thousands and thousands of pages the example in this point could be that when enforcement directorate under the pmla try to trace that black money has been projected as white money and they are doing the audit trail of all the transactions that have taken place for 20 years the documentary evidences would run into sometimes 5000 pages so what we are trying to say here that for the detection and to appreciate that something has resulted into an act which is an offense that has been criminalized by the state it may take a lot of time and by that time that resentment of the public is also lost with the efflux of the time so what we look here that obviously when we say that who is the individual who communicates about the perpetuations of these crimes it is the fourth pillar of the democracy that is media but it has been noted that these news channels or media houses are owned by those people who are breaking the law so the news never reached to the public so how their resentment would be organized and sutherland then had made a very important observation and it holds true to date now when we are talking about what are the other forms of crime that were noticed by the 29th commission one such offense was noticed and that was the organized crime now what is organized crime let's understand with the help of example sometimes we come across news like a person has been secreted away from the rural part of the india on the pretext of offering a job in the urban area or in some new country then this victim is taken for any of the purposes like bonded labor for human trafficking to be engaged in commercial sexual exploitation and ultimately this person has reached to let's say place d this person was secreted away from place a maybe by kidnapping or on the pretense of false promise in the hope of getting a better lifestyle or a job so fraud or deceit has been practiced that does not matter but what has been done in here that person has been picked up from place a then the person reaches place b and then c and ultimately to d so in this entire chain there are a lot of people who are joining hands together and sometimes 
Now, the possibility cannot be ruled out that these people were able to perpetrate this crime without getting the support of those officials who are the part of the government machinery. So, what happens here is that when people are coming together to perpetrate a crime, we say that this is the organized crime, right? So, when we are saying that the people working in the government are lending the support to these people who are involved in the human trafficking racket. Here, both these people are joining hands together. So, what they are being labeled as that this offense would be called as racketeering. So, let's get into the ingredients of it or the definition of it. The committee noted that other types of crime exist which are organized crimes. Crimes wherein traditional offenders join hands with the big business men for securing ends which are harmful to the community. Now, this was popularly known as racketeering, organized conspiracy for exploitation. So, when let's say I need to send money to another country, instead of following the legitimate chain that exists in the state, I transfer this money through the Hawala system. So, I must have joined my hands with those people who work in the Hawala. So, what we are looking here that a gangster and a professional in order to siphon of the money are joining hands together. So, what type of crime is this? This is the organized crime and what type of racket is this? This is called as racketeering. Now, when we look at this, the committee noted that such activity is stated may be indulged in by businessmen, leaders or organized labor, politicians, criminals or even lawyers, but the purpose is exploitation of commerce and public through the circumscribing the right to work and do the business. So, the committee had made a very important note here that committee was not only concerned with what type of crimes are being committed, but committee went a step ahead and also noticed who are the people who are committing these type of crimes. Now, one another important observation was made in the para 24 of the report wherein the testimony of the US judge named as Samuel Leobutz, he had made a statement that there are criminal lawyers and lawyer criminals. Now, this is very interesting that there are criminal lawyers and lawyer criminals. Now, who are they? Criminal lawyers are someone who come to the court and defend their client following all the right procedures which is expected from him. But then there is a lawyer who joins hands with the gangster. Now, he is at the back end of this gangster who tells him that how to flout the laws to get away with the system. Now, who has he become? He has become the lawyer criminal. Is he someone who is committing the socio-economic offense? The answer is yes. Is he someone who is doing it during the course of his occupation? Again, the answer is yes. So, he is not only committing socio-economic offense, which was the larger bracket, but he is also committing the white collar crime. So, this report had tried to make the distinction between the two types of criminality that are being discussed in here. Now, coming to this point, uh, when we talk about that racketeering is happening when you are joining the hands with uh, the traditional offenders, let's say trafficking of person, one may argue that strictly speaking, it is not a white collar crime, right? Now, the other side of it, the other view is also that, that the meaning of the white collar crime has evolved over the years. If we look at the nature of the white collar crimes, it is essentially a non-violent crime, right? Financially, uh, financially motivated. So, it does ticks of the boxes which are requirement of the white collar definition. So, the criticism has also been made whether they are white collar crimes or they are not white collar crimes. Previously, I discussed that it was noticed that white collar crime or socio-economic offenses are a peculiar feature of the acquisitive or affluent society. But in that year of uh, 1966, our society was not affluent in contrast to the Western world. 
but what was important that we were at the stage where this type of criminality started to emerge so india should have prepared itself to cope up with this new form of criminality so they were way ahead of their times when they were discussing all the consequences what were the suggestions that were made we have already discussed this so i am going to skip it now coming to the vanchu committee which was constituted in the year 1970 now this committee was the committee on the indirect taxes which also dealt with the aspect of black money in the context of money laundering previously we noticed that the public servants or people from certain social class are the ones who are augmenting the wealth how they were augmenting the wealth by abusing their offices so once they have abused their office they are not going to pay taxes on it so where this money would go they will siphon of the money to another country what country to the tax haven countries or they may invest in other places wherein you do not have to pay the taxes so what we are witnessing here is that that the parallel economy arises and this parallel economy is not good for any economic structure of a given state so the committee noticed the example has been is going to be used that when we purchase the property the circulation rate could be 60 40 where 60% is the white money and 40% is your black money so you are channelizing your black money and introducing that black money into the legitimate financial system now the committee also noticed that when we talk about white collar criminality it also leads to the emergence of the clandestine market where the things are available at a higher price than the control price again you are violating the regulations and causing the loss which is the economic loss to the state tax evasion and black money are closely interlinked if someone is not paying the taxes black money is going to rise in number and volume and what will be the consequences of it it will hampers the economic growth limits the welfare programs and it multiplies the inflation which is not good for anyone now moving forward after this we had 47th law commission report the title was the trial and the punishment of socio economic offences 1972 the objective of this report was to analyze and suggest changes to the existing law to make it more effective and stringent against the socio economic crime now in this report the committee noted that why we must take the action in combating this new form of criminality so the committee noted that interest is two folded and this interest is seen from the perspective of protecting the social interest now have a look at para number 1.4 and in there you will come across bullet number 6 interest is going to be protected in two fold manner one social interest in the preservation of if we combat with the white collar crimes we are going to actually preserve something what we are preserving the property or wealth or health of its individual members and the resources the general economic system as a whole from exploitation that the money is not being augmented only in the hands of a few people waste by individual groups so we are looking at the riches are not getting more rich and the poor are not getting more poorer so that balance is tried to be at least dealt with in this report b says social interest now both the things are focusing on the social interest in the augmentation of the wealth of the country by enforcing the laws relating to taxes duties foreign exchange foreign commerce industries and the like now these are some important observations and they are important more so because in these types of offenses the victim cannot be identified sometimes we say that these are the victim less crimes now what happens let's say someone has been assaulted or someone has been someone has been assaulted or someone has been robbed 
Now we have a victim who is interested in getting the perpetrator punished, right? When we talk about white collar crime and the example is of tax evasion, which is difficult in detection, in its detection. And we come to this news after years later that this businessman had kept false security with the bank and had taken loan to the tune of 1000 crores and now this person has absconded. He is a fugitive offender now, right? So in this case, we may say that there is no victim, direct victim who is interested in getting the perpetrator, right? Punished or prosecuted. But no doubt the victim in here is the state when keeping the false collaterals, the loan is taken for the to the tune of 1000 crore rupees. So there is a victim, but who is the victim here? The state at large is the victim. So when we talk about that, what is the response uh, from, the side of, uh, from the side of the victim? The response that we see that someone is interested in getting the perpetrator punished, it is scattered or sometimes it is missing when we deal with the white collar crimes. Now chapter third is very interesting, which makes a reference to the which makes a reference to the sentencing policy now when we talk about criminal liability andrew ashworth had said that criminal liability infliction of the sentence upon an individual is the strongest form of condemnation that a state can inflict upon the personal liberties of a person. And this curtailing of the personal liberties of the person must be supported with strong justification. You cannot deprive someone of his personal liberty without having strong justification. So what we are talking about, we are talking about the sentencing policy. Now, one of, the, one of the role of the criminal law is to penalize the conduct, but also it is seen as a system of social control. That is being noticed under this law commission report. Now, it gains two important role in two ways. One, that first, when we talk about criminal liability or the sentencing, we are talking about the sanctions being put by the state upon this person. Punishment along with itself carries a stigma. When someone is being punished, that person is being stigmatized and looked down upon in the society. Now, it is very interesting to note in here that the word sigma has originated from the Greek word called sigma. So what used to happen in that society that if someone has committed the offense against the state or against any person, the body of the individual will be marked or burned with certain signs. Now it was a declaration and this mark will be made on the body on such part of the body where it is visible to the public eye. Now the reason for this was that as this person moves into the society, this person is going to be looked down upon. Why? Because the public now can tell that this person has done something wrong. So when we talk about stigmatization, it has its origin from this sigma word, which is of the Greek origin. And when we talk about sanctions, we see that the kind of harm that you have caused Proportional punishment should be given to you. One such example can be taken on this point that when we talk about Food Safety and Standards Act, if non-injurious injury is being caused, the person may be sentenced in the form of fine. When it has led to some grievous injury, the person may be imprisoned with some sentence. The person, the person may be sentenced with an imprisonment. Now, what are the suggestions of the 47th Law Commission report? One, special courts are to be established who can take up the matter expeditiously. 
to simplify the procedures for ensuring the fair and speedy trial, for having the increased penalties and causing the deterrent, deterrence to the potential offenders and graded punishment was also recommended in the report. To have independent prosecutorial agencies, those who are having the knowledge how to deal with this type of criminality and such bodies in place are CBI, ED and etc. Now when we are talking about that what are socio-economic offences and white collar crimes, some of these socio-economic offences are also called as strict liability offences that there is no requirement of proving the mens rea at all. In that sense, they automatically becomes strict liability offences. So sometimes you can say that strict liability offences and socio-economic offences at the intersection can have white collar crimes. Now organized crime we have already discussed. You can refer to the definition given by United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. UNODC where a group of three or more persons come together to commit a serious crime in order to obtain a financial or other material benefit. Now what are the occupational crimes? Occupational crimes are white collar crimes which are committed by the person during the course of his occupation. Now the examples on this point are as follows embezzlement where a financial manager is diverting the company's fund, insider trading, forgery or fraud, forgery or fraud against your own company, kickbacks or bribery. We have seen that in the Indian context, the doctors are being offered with kickbacks, but we do not have any central legislation to criminal legislation to deal with these kickbacks. The penalty can be levied under the civil litigation. Now coming to the corporate criminal liability, one thinks about that when the corporation has committed the tax fraud, who is the person who is going to be penalized for it? Company as an entity is a juristic person, it is not a natural person. So are we going to punish someone which does not exist in flesh and blood? The answer is no. But the company or a corporation exercise its function through some important persons. So how can we prosecute the company? So some person must have acted on the behalf of the company and in that case the acts of the individuals are the acts for the company or the corporation and that had led to the emergence of doctrine of attribution wherein you can attribute, wherein you can find out the circumstances under which the actions of the individual within a corporation can be imputed or attributed to the corporation itself. So this is the important aspect of it. One may refer to Sunil Bharti Mittal versus CBI case in order to understand the doctrine of vicarious liability and the court has incidentally discussed the theory of attribution. Now coming to the last slide, Tufan Singh versus state of Tamil Nadu, the court had made very important observation that socio-economic offences can also be called as white collar crimes and the important line here is socio-economic offences such as trafficking in NDPS, food adulteration, black marketing, profiteering, hoarding, smuggling, tax evasion and the like which are white collar crime. So this is a very important judgment wherein socio-economic offences have been equated with white-collar crime. So today we have discussed about how these offences have emerged in Indian context and what is the response of the state against this newer form of criminality. Thank you.